Jesus' name, amen. Children up through second grade, you guys and gals are dismissed to Kids Cove. You can head to the back of the room and our children's ministry workers will be waiting on you there. Older children and everyone else in the room, grab your Bible and let's go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 is our primary text for the day. And as you're turning there, <clears throat> let me draw your attention to the email that went out this past week reminding you that uh, after today, I'm going to be on sabbatical, which means that I'll disappear for a little while. Uh, the idea behind the sabbatical is a pretty simple one. If you have a horse, and he's at least a halfway decent horse, and you want him to stay around for a while, and you run him pretty hard, you'll get more miles out of that horse if occasionally you let him rest. That's the idea. Let me say that I'm grateful to our elders for crafting, developing a policy that allows me an occasional rest. And any future full-time pastoral staff member that we might hire provides the same occasional rest for them. Uh, let me say how grateful I am to our elders, deacons, and staff members for holding down the fort while I'm away in June and July. I'm grateful as well to Richard Reeves, who is here with us this morning and who will be handling the preaching of God's Word starting next Sunday. You're in good hands with Richard. I'm grateful for you, Faith Church. I'm grateful for the past seven years of serving as your pastor. We have been through a lot together. We have been through church revitalization, weathered a pandemic. We've been through a capital campaign and reconfigured our campus here that the Lord has blessed us with. We've helped plant churches. We've seen dozens and dozens of people baptized right here at Faith Church. Since 2020, both our attendance on Sunday mornings and our preschool enrollment have doubled. Do you see how God has been at work in our midst? I see it. I see it. And I'm grateful for it. I would ask that you pray for me and for my family while we're away this summer. Would you pray that this would be a season of respite from the demands of ministry, a time of rest and reflection and recharging so that I come back ready to hit the ground running. And I'm going to pray for you too. I'm not supposed to do ministry-related work while I'm on sabbatical, but prayer is not work. Prayer is asking and trusting God to work. So I will pray for you. And I ask you to pray for me as well. Remember that the mission continues while I'm away. In Philippians, Paul says of the Philippian church, always when I was present with you, you were obedient to God's word. Always when I was present, you were obedient. Now, now that I'm absent from you, he says, be even more obedient. Be even more faithful. That's my prayer for you, Faith Church, in the summer. Now, in light of that, let's look at our text for today, Acts chapter 2. If you are willing and able, will you stand with me in honor of the reading of God's Word? Here at the end of Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, listen carefully to these words from God's Word. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Well, today we are wrapping up this body art series, which has been a series on the marks of a true local church. Long ago, in a place called Caesarea Philippi, Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus is referring to the universal church, all believers throughout history and around the world. And this universal church finds expression in local churches. Particular groups of people who meet in certain places devoted to specific practices. The question we have been exploring in this series is, how do I know a true local church when I see one? 
how do I know that this group over here is a church and that group over there is not a church? How do I know? And what we've learned is that since the time of the Protestant Reformation, there have been three primary marks, the body art, if you will, that identifies a local church. The preaching of God's word, the sacraments of baptism and communion, and the practice of church discipline or life-on-life -life discipleship. This is how we know a true church when we see one. Now, mindful of these practices, these very strange practices, by the way, and we've talked about that throughout this series. All of these things seem outdated. Preaching, for example. You're going to sit here for the next 30 or 40 minutes and listen to me give you a speech, a monologue. This is not a dialogue. There's no diversity of opinions here. Where else do you go today where anything like that happens? This seems so incredibly outdated. This strange practice, however, and all of these are equally strange... These are the practices in and through which God works. This is how you know a true church when you see one. Mindful of these practices then, we're able to see certain good ministries that are not true churches. The classes I teach at Covenant Academy, for example, that's a good ministry because we're studying the Bible together, but it's not a church. It can't be a church because we're not practicing the sacraments of baptism and communion. We're not practicing church discipline. A good ministry? Yes. A church? No. Mindful of these practices, we're also able to see that there are a number of churches that are not true churches. Let's say that over the summer, you're traveling, and while you're traveling, you decide to visit a new church. And so you go to a place on a Sunday morning that has the word church on the sign out front. We'll call this place New Church. You walk into New Church, and it's packed. There are people everywhere, and it's a thrilling place. They got smoke machines galore, fog machines going. You can't see a thing when you walk into the worship center because there's so much fog. But you know the Holy Spirit is there, right? Because the Holy Spirit comes from the fog, from the machine, right? Fog everywhere, you know the Spirit's working, you walk on in, and you notice this is a very tech-savvy place. They've got all the latest technology. Lights, sound, LED walls, 3D printers. Who knows why they need the 3D printers in the foyer, but they're there because it's the latest tech, and so they got it. They have espresso machines for the adults, so that as you walk in, you all can be properly caffeinated. Get this. They even have virtual reality goggles. You can check them out for your children as you come through the foyer so the children will not be bored in worship. They have thought of everything, every possible amenity. And then you come into the service. And the worship leader begins the service by saying to you, sit back, relax, and watch what happens. And if you were here a few weeks ago, you know how much I hate that. And then at some point in the service, the pastor takes the stage, and immediately you are struck. You can tell this guy is stylish, he's polished, he is an excellent communicator. As you listen to him, you begin to say to yourself, I see why there are so many people here. I get it. But in those 15 or 20 minutes that the pastor is on stage, he never once opens the Bible. Well, sure, there's some vague religious talk, but he never takes the people through a passage of Scripture. He doesn't preach God's Word. If that's what you experience at New Church, then you must be able to see that New Church is not a true church. That man on stage may be spectacular, but the message is powerless. The people in that place may be transfixed, but they will not be transformed because the power is in these strange practices like the preaching of God's word, the administration of the sacraments, the practice of life on life, discipleship. Now, if you've listened carefully in this series, then you will have picked up on the fact that each week I have said, since the time of the Protestant Reformation, these have been the marks of a true local church. And maybe you've heard that and thought to yourself, well, what about before the Protestant Reformation? What about before the 1600s? 
the 1500s. Martin Luther, John Calvin, the church didn't begin with them. And of course, you're right. And the, the reformers would have been very quick to point that out. No, the church didn't begin with them. What the reformers were doing as they sought to reform the church is they sought to return to the practices that they found in the scriptures themselves. To return to these practices that along the way had been lost. What I want to do today in the finale of this series is show you that from its inception, from its inception, the true church has been marked by these very practices we've been learning about. We see all of these practices, we see it all coming together, either explicitly or implicitly, here at the end of Acts chapter 2. Here we get this beautiful cameo of the early Christians, the first Christians. We get this wonderful glimpse of the body functioning as the body. I want us to see five observations in this short but important passage of Scripture. First and foundational for the other four, this is a community. It's a community. Let me give you the context before we look at the text itself. It's the day of Pentecost. Peter has just preached the first Christian sermon. And as he preached the gospel, the gospel entered through people's ears and God worked in their hearts. And on this one day, through this one message, 3,000 people were converted. They believed, they received the word, and they were baptized. 3,000 people. And now Luke, the writer of Acts, gives us a description of the things that these first Christians devoted themselves to. That's the context. And look at what he says in verse 42. And they, these early Christians, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship. The fellowship. Now this word that Luke uses, fellowship, is the word koinonia. We've talked about this before. Koinonia. It means a close association. Communion. Partnership. And as we will see in this passage... It's a costly partnership. This is a costly commitment to each other. That's what this fellowship is. There was a great diversity in this group. Think about it. 3,000 people in one day converted. And now they all compose this new community. There is something about this community called the church that is unlike every other community in the world. They and we are completely different every age and stage of life. So much diversity when it comes to cultural backgrounds, socioeconomic experiences, educational backgrounds, political parties. We're so very different, and yet we're together, committed to each other in a deep-seated and high-cost kind of way, willing to make sacrificial commitments to each other like this. Why is the church this way? Because it's a community built on the gospel. It's all about the gospel. We see that in the text here. Look, not only does, Paul, excuse me, does Luke mention the fellowship, twice in this short passage he refers to the breaking of bread. They devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. Then in verse 46, And day by day attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. This more than likely is a reference to communion. Think back to the very first week of this series when we studied communion and we looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. You remember I described to you what communion looked like in the Corinthian setting? The Christians came together in homes and they had a full meal. They broke bread together. And part of that full meal was the practice of communion. It seems that these early Christians in Acts 2 are doing the very same thing. They're coming together for a, for a full meal, and part of that meal is communion. In other words, their togetherness, their fellowship is all built around the remembrance of the gospel. The remembrance of who Jesus Christ is and what he has done for us in his life, death, and resurrection. These people who are so very different have been brought together by the blood of Christ. You see, when you understand that... You understand how we can be together, despite our differences. Because at our very core, we're the same. At our very core, we're the same. We are all equally unworthy of God's love. 
And we are all equal recipients of God's grace. Brother, sister, you and I are exactly alike. So desperately in need of God's grace. And equal recipients of it. This is the togetherness, the fellowship of these first Christians. Now, it's increasingly common these days to hear someone say something like this. I know Jesus. I know Jesus, but I don't need the church. Right? You've probably heard someone say that. Maybe a, a friend, a family member says that to you often. I know Jesus, but I don't need the church. Friend, if you truly know Jesus, then you are part of the universal church. And you need to commit yourself to a true local church. You need to commit yourself to a true local church. The entire New Testament assumes that believers will belong to a local church. Think about the image, the metaphor of the body. The church is the body of Christ. Just think about that. That metaphor doesn't work at all unless we're together. Unless we're together. The church is the body of Christ. So what are you waiting for? Commit to a true local church. Commit to Faith Church. Partner with us here. Or if Faith Church is not the right place for you, then find another true local church and partner with them. A Christian without a church family is a contradiction. It's a contradiction. First and most foundational, this is a community. A community. Second, it's a learning community. A learning community. Look at verse 42 again. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The apostles have the authority to preach and teach because of their apprenticeship under Jesus. They walked with Jesus himself. They listened to him, learned from him. And now they're preaching and teaching all about Jesus. The apostles are so devoted to this, as a matter of fact, that later in Acts chapter 6... As the church continues to grow, and as the demands of ministry become too much for the apostles, they recruit assistants, people to help them do other important works of ministry, like caring for the widows, so that the apostles themselves can remain devoted to preaching and to prayer. It's such an important matter, it's such a high priority, that they will not let anything else displace the teaching of God's word. So the apostles continue to teach, the church continues to listen. And not only listen, they learn and they live it out. They devote themselves to the apostles' teaching, to taking it in and living it out, getting it out into the world. One of the things that I want you to remember here is the context. Remember that this is all occurring at the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit first comes to live within believers. So remember the full story here. Jesus crucified, risen, he ascends into heaven. He sends the Holy Spirit to live within his people. This community that we're reading about is the first spirit-filled community. The first spirit-filled community and they're a scholastic community. They're a bookish community. They devote themselves to the apostles' teaching. They're at the feet of the apostles eager to learn and to grow. Some people say that if you have the Holy Spirit, if you experience the Spirit in your heart, then you don't really need to apply your head. But that's not what we see in Acts 2. This is, in fact, the very first Spirit-filled community, and it's a scholastic community, a learning community. They are eager to grow. Now, what about you? What about you? Are you eager to grow in this way? Think about the word that Luke uses here, devoted. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. To what are you devoted? How do you know if you're devoted to something? Well, you plan for it. You prioritize it. You rearrange your schedule. Get up earlier in the morning if you have to to make room for it. Say no to this thing over here so that you can say yes to this thing over here that you're devoted to. You spend your money and your time on it. To what are you devoted? If you're devoted to God's word, you'll know it. Because you'll be changed. You'll be changed. You'll become more like the God of the word. You'll become more loving, more generous, 
exactly what we see happening here. That brings us to the third observation. This is also a giving community. A giving community. Look at verses 42, uh, 44 and 45. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Now we begin to see the costliness of this commitment they had to each other. That koinonia, that fellowship that we saw earlier, it was expressed in practical ways, in painful ways even. These Christians are selling their possessions to give to others. Again, remember the size of the group, 3,000 people. It was a diverse crowd, including socioeconomic diversity. There were some in this community that had greater possessions. There were others that had lesser possessions and more needs. In today's terms, this community would have had single moms working two jobs to make ends meet. In today's terms, this community would have had people who had been laid off at work. Their jobs are now obsolete. AI can do the job. People who have just gotten out of rehab, yet to find work. The point is there were people in need. There were people in need. The Apostle John in his first letter says this. If you have the world's goods and you see your brother in need and you shut up your heart, you do nothing, how can the love of God abide in you? These early Christians demonstrate that the love of God abides in them by the way they come to the aid of their needy brothers and sisters ministering to those who need help in very practical, even painful ways. One commentator says of these verses, this is disturbing. Disturbing, he says. He's right. It's painful. This is a type of giving you feel. This is sacrificial giving. Taking your possessions, selling them, and then taking that money and giving it away. Who does this? Now, what exactly is happening here? What exactly is happening here? Is this some sort of pre-Marx communism? No personal property? Only common ownership? No, it can't be that. It can't be that, and here's how we know. Luke has already told us that these Christians were meeting in homes. Some of these Christians were homeowners. They own their own homes, so it can't be that. Here's what's happening, and here's the difference. Communism says, what's yours is mine, and I'll take it. Christianity says, what's mine is yours, and I'll give it. Because our God is the great giver. You see the difference? Willingly, voluntarily, they sell their possessions in order to minister to other members of the community who are in times of desperate need. See, when you know the one true God, the God who is the giving God, you will give. You will give. So what then do your giving practices reveal about you and your relationship to the God who is the great giver? Are you giving sacrificially, regularly, monthly to support the ministries of Faith Church, for example? If not, now is a great time to start. It's the first Sunday of a month. It so happens to be the time of year, the summer, when we need your support the most. What are you waiting on? Start giving generously, sacrificially, just like these early Christians. When you know the God who gives, you will become increasingly generous, a giving community. Fourth, we also see that this is a worshiping community, a worshiping community. Verse 42, and they devoted themselves to the prayers the prayers. Now, I want you to notice here that authentic Christianity, genuine Christianity, is both intellectual and experiential. They devote themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the prayers. They expound what today we would call the scriptures, and they experience God in prayer. It's a both and. Now, depending on who you are, your personality type your stage of life, your church background perhaps, you likely will be inclined to prioritize one of those at the expense of the other. 
In other words, you'll be more drawn to the intellectual or more drawn to the experiential, but they go together. They go together. Think about how. It's in the scriptures that we learn about prayer, that we learn about the God to whom we pray. It's in prayer that we experience, encounter this God who has revealed himself to us in the scriptures. Study without prayer is like being given a personal invitation from a world-renowned artist to come and to view some of his art in his presence. And you go, and you look at the art, and you say nothing to the artist. Not a word. How rude. How disrespectful. Why on earth would we do that? But on the other hand, prayer without scripture, without study, is like experiencing some historical sight without knowing any of the history, without knowing any of the truths of this great terrain. Sure, you can visit the beaches of Normandy without knowing anything of the history, but oh, what a weightier experience it will be if you know about the D-Day landings. These two things go together, study and prayer, the intellectual and the experiential, two sides of the one coin that is Christian living. They are devoted to prayer. And notice as well in verse 46 how they're described. Day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they receive their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God. This is a community marked by gladness, joy. They are worshipful people. The entire community is like a giant choir. Now, I don't think that means that always they were singing. I don't think it means that randomly they just broke out into song, like a musical or something like that. I don't think that's the point. The point, rather, is that they were known for their all-of-life allegiance to the one true God. In everything they did, they expressed their admiration for the God who had saved them. They were known by this. And as they live this way, people take notice. Do you see that in the text? Look at the very end of that verse. Praising God and having favor with all the people. Having the respect of all the people. See, up until this point, everything that Luke has told us about these first Christians, it's all been about in-group activities. Within this community, they studied the scriptures, they prayed, they praised, they helped each other. But all of that is in-group stuff. Where's the outreach? Where is the evangelistic emphasis? In the same way that this passage challenges us that authentic Christianity must be both intellectual and experiential, it also challenges us about driving a wedge between discipleship and evangelism. The true church will value both, and there will be a seamless integration of them. As the church functions as the church, people take notice. This is not only a worshiping community, fifth and finally, it is a witnessing community. Look at the end of the passage. Day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with respect of all the people. And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. What a wonderful verse. As the church functions as the church, as the body lives as the body, people take notice. The world watches. Presumably, some unbelievers started asking questions. They started attending some of these Christian gatherings. They wanted to learn the apostles' teaching. They wanted to learn about prayer. And God saves them. We see very clearly our role and God's role here. What is our role? Learn the gospel, live it, and let it out. But only God can let it in, into someone's heart. Only the Lord can save. We share. He saves. That final verse is such a hopeful and heartening verse. It's a description of this steady and uninterrupted growth of the church. But as we think about our own community, 
as we look around our nation and the world, so many churches are not growing. In fact, many of them are declining. Why is that? Well, there are many factors, I'm sure. One of the main ones, I think, is that so many churches have forgotten what it means to be the church, to be the body. Remember at the outset, and several times in this series, so I hope it's starting to sink in, remember when I said these practices we've been learning about, preaching, the sacraments, life-on-life discipleship, these practices are strange. They seem so outdated. And yet, God works in and through the strange. But so many churches today are trying to de-strange things. They're focusing on originality rather than fidelity. They're looking for new practices that go with this new age in which we live. We need a new type of church. Well, listen to me. If God works in and through the strange and you de-strange things, then it makes perfect sense that you're in decline. It makes perfect sense. We must remain committed to these strange practices, the very practices that make a place a true local church, because this is where God works. Let me close with a short analogy. Nijay Gupta is a New Testament scholar. He's written a number of articles and books and commentaries. His latest book is called Strange Religion. Strange Religion. It's all about the strange beliefs and practices of the early Christians in the Roman world. And throughout the book, he uses the analogy of coconut water. Coconut water is his favorite drink because he's a hippie who lives in Portland. (laughs) By his own admission. Coconut water is his favorite drink. And when he first started drinking it, he experimented with all different brands to finally find the one that he liked. But then one day he was in Costco. And he saw a new brand, one he had never heard of. Something harvest, organic coconut water. But what struck him was not so much the brand, but the color. See, until that day, all the coconut water that he had had, it had all been clear. This coconut water was pink. Why was it pink? He's a researcher, so he set out on an investigation. And here's what he found. When the natural sugars from the coconut touch oxygen, it turns the water pink. Pink is the color bottled coconut water should be but these companies what they've done is they've added preservatives and chemicals to the water to eliminate the pink color why because they think the consumer wants to see clear water after all clear is natural right ironically they've added chemicals to the coconut water to get rid of the pink to get rid of the strange but the real deal is strange. Friends, real Christianity is strange. It's supposed to be in these ways that we've been learning about. Don't settle for the de-stranged, chemically altered versions. Stay strange. Remain committed to these practices revealed in God's Word and watch how God works. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you how in this series you have reminded us of what a true church is. Help us always to be committed to the preaching of your word, to the practices of baptism and communion, to living in a life-on-life type of way, loving one another enough to come after a brother or sister who is struggling, to lend a helping hand when it's needed. Help us to be faithful to your word always. We believe, God, that our effectiveness as a church will depend on our faithfulness to your word. We thank you for your word. And as we transition now to a time of communion, we confess to you that we are indeed unworthy of your love. God, we have failed you in so many ways. We have not loved you with our whole selves. We have not loved our neighbors the way you teach us to love, the way you call us to love. Forgive us, God. Forgive us. 
for what we have thought and said, for the things we have done, and those we have left undone. We thank you for the sacrifice of your son Jesus Christ in our place for our sins. And we know that all of us who have faith in Christ, we are indeed forgiven. We take refuge in that wonderful promise of your word that when we confess our sin like this, you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you, God, for your grace, your mercy. When we are faithless, you remain faithful. We celebrate this truth. We celebrate the gospel as we come to your table, Lord Jesus.